Hi friends, Sinead here with VPIRG with some more exciting news. Town meeting day elections will be using ranked choice voting for the first time since the 2021 charter change and all Burlington voters get to participate. Unfamiliar with ranked choice voting? Keep watching or click the link below. Ranked choice voting lets voters rank candidates in order of preference, first, second, third, and so on. If your vote can't help your first choice win, it counts to your second choice instead. Here's how it works. If one candidate gets over 50% of everyone's first choice votes, they win and the election is over. However, if no candidate reaches a majority, the candidate with the fewest first choice votes is eliminated and their supporters' votes will count toward their second choice. This process continues until one candidate reaches over 50% of the vote. Ranked choice voting gives voters more voice, more choice, and makes for a stronger democracy. Learn more about ranked choice or try it out for yourself at betterballotvermont.org btv 2023. Welcome to ongoing Town Meeting Day election coverage by Town Meeting Television. This is one of a series of forums we are bringing you in advance of Town Meeting Day, which is on Tuesday, March 7th, 2023. Town Meeting TV hosts forums with all candidates and covers ballot, ballot items you will see on your ballot. Town Meeting TV election forums introduce you to community decision makers and connect you with issues that shape your local community. If you are tuning in live, we welcome your questions at 802-862-3966. Watch Town Meeting TV on Comcast Channel 1087, Burlington Telecom Channel 17 and 217, as well as online at youtube.com and Town Meeting TV. Great. Thanks so much. Welcome. Thank you. Um, please tell us why you are running and what will be different from Burlington if you are elected. Milo. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mila Grant. I've lived in Burlington for almost 40 years, uh, mostly in wards two and three. I currently own a home in ward three where I raised my nephew. He went to Hunt Middle School in BHS. I am currently serving on the police commission and that has given me a lot of experience um, learning about commissions, learning about uh, the city council, working with city council committees. So I'm um, also very well versed in uh, public safety issues. So I'm deeply concerned about the drug uh, crisis. I am deeply concerned about the loss of vibrancy in our community and other livability issues such as um, you know, affordable housing and also building co connections with people, not just between residents, but also between the city. And I feel what I would bring um, that would be different is that I, I'm ready to go with what I already know. I can hit the ground running and um, I'm not afraid to speak up about injustice and things that I feel that are, are not right in uh, City Hall. Thank you. Great, thanks. Avery? Yeah, hi, I'm Avery Musicar. I'm running as an independent. Uh, this is my first time running for anything. I've lived in Burlington for about 10 years. I work at UVM as a uh, assistant director in residential life, and I serve as a uh, steward on our staff union. I'm running because I've been really frustrated with my representation for the last few years. And I think that in Burlington, our progressive and democratic system makes us feel a lot further apart than we actually are. And that many of us want the same things as far as safety and affordability and inclusion. And we need people in city government who are problem solvers, who aren't so wedded to their ideology that they won't compromise and actually move the ball forward uh, on all of those issues. And my experience in management and leadership in working through the union to improve conditions for our staff on campus, I think give me a lot of experience with um, actually making progress on meaningful issues. Great, thanks so much. And we have somebody who's calling in with a question. <laughs> Hi there, please state Hi. your name and your question. Fantastic, my name is Ryan Ward. My question is, exactly how much will the community control board cost, and how will it be paid for along with the new high school? Great. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, Avery, we'll have you go first. Uh, I think cost is one of my major concerns with the uh, control board item. I think that there's been, I mean, there's been no forecast on how much it's going to cost. It's an entirely new body. There's an accompanying department that would go along with it and a bureaucracy and you know, there's gonna be staff in that uh, department which are stipulated at uh, a livable wage, which is important, but also this is a whole new staff for the city. So I, I don't know, I don't think we've been given the information that we would need to make a decision on that. Great, thanks. Um, I would say we cannot afford not to do it. Um, unfortunately, we've had some injustices that have in fact 
occurred in Burlington. Our police department has had some of the issues that we have seen nationally. Um, when we take a look at having to pay $300,000 to um, get a bad officer to leave, when we take a look at the other lawsuits that have been paid out, when we take a look at um, a $75,000 being spent on a police transformation that resulted in a plagiarized report. We're spending all this other money. In addition, the Millie Brothers case, uh, the incident that occurred in 2018, lawsuit made, was made public in 2019, and the city of Burlington is still spending money to fight that. So I'm interested to know all those other costs because I think they can be put to better use on the Community Control Board. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, as far as the budget, Will you be supporting the Burlington School Budget's 4.9% increase over last year? Are you concerned about proposed teacher cuts? Why or why not? And we'll go with Mila first. We'll alternate. Thank you. I definitely support the school budget. I know it gets difficult every year, especially given the um, increase in property taxes. But we have to have good schools. They are crucial to um, the future of the city, so I do support it. The cuts seem to be appropriate in terms of the fact that there is a decrease in enrollment. I was happy to hear that they are working on um, saving the drama position at uh, the Integrated Arts Academy, uh, considering that that was the Arts Academy, that was something I heard in the community where people were concerned about the loss of that position. Uh, so I definitely support it, thank you. Great, Avery? Yeah, I'm also in support of it, I think. For a lot of the same reasons that um, you know, obviously education is one of our major priorities here. I think as far as the staff cuts that have been proposed, we should trust the school board to make their decisions on that. And I think that they are taking into account making sure that the functions of those roles are still maintained, like with the with the arts position. Uh, I do think there is a concern about uh, cost, especially with with building the new school. But of all of the things that we spend money on in the city and the areas where we could find waste and make cuts, that's not the area to start with. Thanks so much. So Burlington has six items before voters on the ballot. Those are Proposition Zero, Instant Runoff Voting, All Resident Voting, Redistricting, Citizen Police Oversight Body, and a Polling Place Change. Of these, how will you vote and what do you feel most strongly about and why? We'll start with Avery this time. Um, so I'm very much in support of All Resident Voting. I think that's, that's really important in opening up the process to everyone who lives in the city and has a stake in it. Uh, very much in favor of ranked choice voting. I uh, School board, yes. What are the other? Uh, just um, make sure I take them all Redistricting? Off. Yes. Um, I don't support the new map, but I do think we need to focus on redistricting and making more substantive changes. The citizen police oversight body and a polling place change are yes. the last two. Supportive of polling place change. I think for the, um, the control board, my main concerns are that we have no idea how much it's going to cost. And while Commissioner Grant raised the, the cost of all of the legal deliberations were already underway, uh, with with all of the cases that exist, that's that would already exist with the police commission. So I would r much rather move towards a directly elected commission that's accountable to the community, which this control board would not be, um, which would be a very different cost model and also much more effective, I think, in its approach. Great. And Proposition Zero, did you touch on that one? Uh, no, and I'm opposed to that one. I think that there's a reason we have representatives. There's a reason we have uh, elected officials who do the work and have the time and the resources to um, properly uh, evaluate and uh, make effective policy changes. I think this creates an opportunity for folks to, A, there's there's huge lobbying that goes on with models like this, like in California, and uh, it results in people not having the information they need to make an informed choice and to have effective policies that have been really well vetted. Right, thank you. Milo? I'm happy to repeat the list too, it's a um, lot. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. I actually have in front of me, I'd appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, so Proposition Zero, I do support. Um, I find in the current system where we have an administration that doesn't actually have a mandate because it could make 50% of the vote and we've had uh, several instances where um, very serious concerns of the people have not uh, been able to be brought forth by members of the city council. So um, I do believe that um, just because something is brought forth by Proposition Zero doesn't mean it hasn't been vetted. I uh, support um, ranked choice voting. 
I support all citizens, all legal citizens voting. I think that's really important considering they live in our community, they work in our community, they pay taxes in our community, their children go to school in the community. So I believe they should have that right um, because it'll help strengthen our community um, and start to build some of these connections uh, that I was talking about. Uh, the oversight body, I do support. Um, previously, as a police commissioner, I, I didn't support it. And I would go to the meetings where it was being talked about. I went to all the uh, charter change committees. This was something that was previously voted but on and approved, but vetoed by the mayor. I at one point did really believe that the police commission could do the work, but um, more recently the mayor and the acting chief have spoken out against the police commission. So there's a lot of things that are going on that are very concerning. Um, it they don't seem to want accountability or oversight. So we have to have a different way to get it. Um, and I think that people need to watch the various programs, uh, MPA meetings, um, different uh, meetings that are being sponsored by other groups to fully explain what this is and give people information uh, so that they understand it better. Um, I really don't have the limited time, but I will say firmly that the attacks on the police commission show that the administration doesn't want the commission doing this work. Um, so to say that they do when on September 19th we were directly attacked by the mayor is very concerning. Um, and then the police chief said that the worker commission was preventing officers from applying to Burlington. So this is really astounding to me. We're private citizens, we are serving. Um, no one has told me that they've ever seen anything like this with a commission. And did I miss any of the others? Redistricting, um, I supported an all ward model um, to uh, counselors per ward, eight wards. Uh, running a district is very difficult because it's two wards, it costs a lot more money, that can be really prohibitive to people. Um, I, I'm leaning to voting for this, but I believe we really should have an, an all ward model. But as long as we're continuing to work on it, I don't, I don't believe there's anything that we would be penalized for. And a uh, polling place change, yes, I think it's important that if this redistricting takes um, Ed, for example, Edmonds would be moved out of the ward is currently in, yet it's a convenient place that people can get in and out of quickly uh, to go and vote. So uh, it makes sense to allow that. Great. Did I get everything? I think I got everything. I think so. Yep. All right. Thank you. Good job. You guys have good memories. Um, the next question, the Vermont legislative season is underway. What are some important initiatives to the community of Burlington that you'll be tracking and supporting as part of your work as a city council member? We'll go Milo first. Sure, um, they're doing a lot of great stuff. Uh, from a public safety standpoint, they'll be working on gun control and something that's very specific to Burlington is we're trying to ask that guns not be allowed in bars because some of the gunfire incidents have occurred in bars. Uh, with regards to family, universal pre-K, uh, universal uh, free meals in schools. Um, there is some prison reform that's being looked at that I think is very important. Uh, bringing back just cause and there would now be a super majority between Democrats and progressives that could get that to pass the legislature even if the governor vetoes it. Uh, the shield laws for um, providers and patients for reproductive care um, and gender affirming care, I think that is also um, important. And those are the main ones that um, I've been looking at. Thank you. Avery. Yeah, I think there are some specific um, Burlington policies that have, that have been passed by the city that have stalled in the State House. So um, the uh, just cause eviction measure and also uh, the gun control uh, restrictions that Burlington wanted to pass that have stalled at the State House level. Um, those are really important. I think the uh, um, legislative efforts on figuring out a more formal arrangement with UVM around capping enrollment and managing the housing crisis is really important. And also I know that there's work being done to make it um, much easier for uh, bars and other establishments to get their licenses and insurance and all the bureaucracy that exists around that because that's one of our great community institutions and a lot of them provide uh, an important social hub as well as, you know, it's a, it's a place of business and it's a place for uh, the makers of the product to, to sell their product. But it's also, you know, you have places like archives, which are on a really specific interest. And then you have a lot of other, you know, venues that are attached to those bars. So I think it's really important that that becomes easier for business owners. Great. Thanks so much. Regarding housing, 
Does Burlington have a housing crisis? And what do you see as the nature of housing in Burlington and how to meet the need for safe and affordable housing for residents, students, and visitors? We'll go Avery first. Yeah, I think anyone who lives in the city can obviously see that there's a massive crisis. Um, there's, there's no getting around that and it's existed for years and it's just getting worse. I work in campus housing. I deal with the brunt of our uh, enrollment numbers every day. And I think that in Burlington, we need to have a real conversation around zoning and what responsible rezoning looks like. I think a lot of people hear zoning and development and they think gentrification, they think we're really destroying the, the integrity of neighborhoods and that does happen in a lot of cities, but we have a chance to do things differently and build density without um, building super high vertically. If, if we just built everything up to the current maximum in the north end, we'd build huge amounts of capacity. If we made it easier for folks to add accessory dwelling units to their homes, in ways that are in reasonable proportion to their property, that would be really helpful. And I also think we need to really seriously think about accessibility as we do this, because when we develop, we usually develop outside of town, which people have to have cars or they're reliant on public transport, which has limits here. And it's just, it puts them uh, a very long way from resources. So I think we need to look at the space that we're already using in the, in the city core and focus on ways to um, have mixed use developments that don't um, produce gentrification. Great, thank you. Mila. Thank you. Um, so I agree too about zoning. So I, I know that there's a lot of changes being worked on with zoning and so I support continuing taking a look at that. Um, the uh, legislation that um, Avery mentioned earlier is going to be brought forth by uh, Troy Hedricks and this is really fantastic because it's, it's going to try to hold UVM accountable to say you have to limit your enrollment. Um, UVM is at about 30 percent of triples which is astounding and so every time they're increasing their enrollment it is directly affecting housing down the line. They have been out of their um, agreement with the city for two years now. I think that's a major issue. I think it's callous of them not to come to the table and have an honest conversation about how difficult it is for people in Burlington right now. I don't think they really understand um, how people are suffering in terms of, you know, being able to pay rent. And it affects our economy in other ways because every dollar that goes toward rent is not going to other places in our economy. And that's affecting the vibrancy of the city. So I hope that people really support what uh, Troy is going to be doing in the legislature. And I hope that um, I can assist the council and the mayor with doing what's necessary to get UVM to come back to the table to uh, talk about these issues and to get back into an agreement. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. Great. It's the main things. Thank you. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about why you care about and want to work as a city councilor for the community of Burlington? What are your favorite spots and why do you live here? We'll go with Mila first. Um, I, well, one of the reasons I stayed in Burlington was because I love the music scene. Um, I've DJed here for many years. I had a lot of friends who were in music and um, operated some of the local clubs. So I was able to, even as, as a black person, and, and there weren't a lot of black people at the time, there are a lot more now, um, but I was able to build a really great safe space for myself. I always I also love the natural beauty of Burlington. I live very close to the waterfront. I get a chance to take advantage of that. Uh, the reason becoming a city councilor is I feel it's the next step um, to do more for the central district, which I feel has been um, neglected by the administration. Um, there's a lot of politics that have been at play. Um, the politics have gotten in the way of talking about solutions, um, and particularly the drug crisis, which hit us first and hardest, and then spread every place else. So um, I think that that is something that's going to be very important for me, advocating for people in our community, uh, which I've done a lot of uh, being on the police commission. Thank you. Thank you. Avery. I came here uh, first as a UVM student um, a little over a decade ago, and so that's what brought me here. But what I think kept me here was uh, the art scene, the music scene. I started busking on Church Street and playing gigs downtown when I was a student. And um, the music scene that we have is so vastly better in proportion to the size of the city than you would expect it to be because we have a lot of venues and community figures who have really supported that and fostered it. I think food as well. Um, food and, and uh, beer. I do some marketing for a hops farm uh, locally. Uh, so I work with a lot of the breweries who are making incredible um, beer that's known internationally as well as nationally. Uh, as far as serving uh, on city council, 
I think a lot of folks like me feel really left out and left behind by our representation and that the folks we have um, in leadership don't reflect the views often of the people in the district and are not serving our needs, that we kick a lot of footballs down the road and we don't actually fix our problems. So I'm interested in solving problems and bringing a lot of stakeholders to the table to find solutions and that's something I do every day at UVM. Great, thanks so much. Um, so your city council race is one of the first in Burlington that um, ranked choice voting is coming into play. In um, this gives voters the chance to rank candidates in order of preference. Please tell us whether and how this has affected how you're campaigning and communicating with voters. We'll go Avery first. Yeah, I don't think it, it affected, it affects the way that I'm campaigning or speaking to people. I know that there's a lot of questions about how that works and that's conversations I've been having um, with folks as we're door knocking and phone calling and all of those things. Uh, I'm really supportive of ranked choice voting. I, I lived in, in Europe for a couple of years and that's very common over there. And I think it really serves democracy to have a, a pluralist representation and to not be worried about spoilers. I think it's really unfortunate in America that uh, an independent candidate or any, any sort of third party candidate is seen as a spoiler and that we, we feel so trapped by, you know, you can only have two options and that anything other than that is somehow undermining those two parties when it should really be about those two parties undermining our system. Um, so I, I don't think it's substantially changed the way that I've approached things, but I think it's a really important next step for our city. Thank you. Milo. Um, I would pretty much agree with uh, everything. It's not changing the way that I campaign. Um, if people ask me where I stand on the ballot items, I definitely talk about supporting it. It's not something I'm hearing a lot about, though. Um, but I do support it for all the reasons that Avery mentioned. Great. Thank Thanks you. so much. As a community with a diversity of languages spoken and a language access policy adopted in 2020, what ways do you see that the city government can expand access and accessibility to more community members who want to participate in local democracy? We'll go Milo first. Thank you, that's a great question because when I think about um, building connections in the community between residents but also with the city and the residents, the, the city is inconsistent about how it chooses to communicate with residents. Um, well, sometimes they don't communicate at all very well about certain things, but um, sometimes they translate things, sometimes they don't translate things. And I think that if we are serious about including all residents um, in all aspects of different things that go on in the city, that there has to be a better mindful mindfulness at the um, administration level to make sure that all the departments are taking communication into account. Like, so whatever project's being worked on, there should be someone who's clearly assigned communication with the community that a project is happening in, and part of their assignment would be to make sure that things are being translated. And that also goes for parks and recreation, because sometimes I see advertisements for uh, recreation and camps and things like that, and they're not always translated in other languages. So we, we might not be reaching people who might be interested in taking part of these things in Burlington. So I'd like to see the consistency in it. Thank you. Thank you. Avery. Yeah, I think too often we expect folks to chase after city government and city programming rather than it coming to them. And I think that one of the things that, that really bothers me about the city is we, we feel such a disconnect from us and our city government. And we always refer to it as the city and it's the city council over there. It's our city and it's our city council and it should be working for us. And so from things as simple as, you know, parking bans, there's no reason we're not automatically texting everyone in the city when their cars are gonna be moved. There's no reason that folks have to tune into an NPA meeting if they can't make it or go in person or go to a city council meeting and follow every commission to know what's going on in the city. The city should be actively communicating those things to all of us in a really proactive way. And I think that when we neglect that, we, we create that divide. We, we don't feel a sense of collective ownership over the process. We don't recognize the impact that, that our participation can have and we don't feel like our participation is, is welcomed. It's something that we have to sort of force and that's not right. So I think in, in terms of, you know, language is a huge piece of that, but it's also about just recognizing the fundamental fact that these things work for us. They are our processes and institutions, and we shouldn't have to go chasing after them. Great. 
Thank you. I would agree with that. If I could also add, yeah. the city's website is terrible. It's one of the main things that I have repeatedly complained about, especially as a police commissioner and especially as people talk about issues around public safety. Where's the data? What does that look like, right? Because people are like, well, we're hearing different things. And um, the website is just terrible. And the fact that not all departments have someone who's updating information and even DPW that uh, posts a lot of information, the way it's it shows is very um, inconsistent. So I would really love to have a project where the city looks at um, updating their website because it would make a huge difference. And I know they're looking at updating or changing uh, from board docs to something else because board docs is where you find all the agendas and documents related to the different meetings and board docs is very cumbersome um, for the average person. If it's cumbersome for commissioners, it's certainly cumbersome for the average person. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. The city council has just sat squarely in the middle of a conversation about crime, police accountability, and racial justice. What is next in your mind for this conversation? Do you think that problems exist? And if so, how shall they be addressed? We'll go Avery first. Yeah, so I think, again, with, with what I was talking about with the city government, there's a really massive disconnect between the city and our police department and the way we approach public safety. And I think that to rebuild that ownership, that feeling of collective ownership with the department, we need, we all, I think, want more transparency and more accountability. And I think that the vast majority of people in the city are really driven to make that happen. And I think that the unfortunate thing about our, our party system in the city is that we feel like we're at polar opposites of the spectrum if we disagree on that. And I think it's really unfortunate that in a lot of progressive spaces where we talk about inclusion and, and lifting up people's voices and making sure that perspectives are heard, that folks who have disagreed with um, the community control board proposal have, have really feel uh, iced out of the conversation or afraid to speak up on that. And that's something I've heard from a lot of voters who are, who are quietly um, concerned about it, but, but feel like they're, they're made to feel like they're on the wrong side of history somehow if they disagree with the implementation. So I think for me, um, having a directly elected uh, police commission that operates more like a school board rather than um, a community control board, which is uh, made up of folks who are nominated by organizations that are completely nebulous, we don't know who they are, um, they, there's no mechanism for them to be removed, they're not accountable to voters. I mean, if people are concerned that the department isn't accountable to the community, it's accountable to the uh, mayor and the chief, then it's even less accountable if it's this completely uh, arbitrary board made up of folks who are, who are just the loudest voices in the room on a lot of these things and are, are sort of directly opposed um, to a lot of uh, law enforcement initiatives. And I think that the other, the other issue is we're completely excluding in the uh, proposal that's on the board um, any folks with professional experience. And that's the most important thing you have when regulating anything. Um, so if we're going to have a body, it should be made up of folks with experience, and it should be directly accountable to voters. Great. Thank you. Milo, and then we'll go to closing comments. Um, I really, again, encourage people to look at the more extended conversations about the community control board. I feel that some of that information misrepresents what it is. Um, if you look at, there are details as to uh, who would be selecting the organizations that would then select uh, the people who would serve on the board. I feel that part of what this board's going to do, for example, when you say there's, there's no professional um, participation, that's not true because if they need to investigate something, they will have that power to do so. Uh, they will, they can have a lawyer. Um, so there is, is definitely ways that um, point of view of law enforcement comes in. Uh, what we have right now uh, with all this power placed to the police chief, even the mayor, you know, said that, yeah, this isn't, this isn't okay. Um, and we unfortunately have a system where the, the residents of Burlington aren't being best served. Um, so I just really can't sum that up in just a couple of minutes. Um, I have been speaking extensively about it. I uh, did an interview about it. That's also on Town Meeting TV and other people are talking. It, it, it requires people to really listen. But I don't think people have been afraid to ask questions. I've been asking uh, 
answering a lot of questions about it and giving people details and giving them also my perspective and my experience um, in terms of what's been happening on the, pub, uh, the police commission, which has been a lot. It's been a lot. And I think the people of Burlington have not been served by our current um, department leadership and by the um, administration with regards to honesty around accountability and oversight. Thank you. Great. Can I Thanks clarify so two quick things? Sure. Uh, I just want to say that again, these are organizations who are choosing the people on this board. It's not the community. And secondly, having the option to consult someone with professional experience is not the same as having people at the table. That's something I deal with every day at the university where theoretically students' perspectives and voices are heard, but unless they are at the table from the get-go, you are not having them have the impact that they need to have at the time when it's most impactful. So bringing people in ad hoc after the fact is not representation. I think we have to be um, considerate of the fact that these people from these different organizations are actually going to be representing residents that have been many times locked out of the process, locked out of being able to speak about these things. And they're more affected by um, policing that is, uh, and misuse of force, and the lack of empathy and compassion in policing, and the lack of equity in policing. So it's saying that these people need to be included because it hasn't been done um, in an honest way previously, quite frankly. And I think that if we're going to build back trust, you know, when we take a look at the contract that the, the union has, the BPOA has, it's a very strong contract, not so strong for the community. You know, there were many things such as how long do we keep records of mm -hmm. disciplinary records? Extremely low, way below best practice. You know, and that got negotiated into the contract. It got raised, I think, one year. So there's a lot of things that are built in to protect law enforcement, but not to protect the public. That's what needs to be addressed. So I think as far as the, I, I know we're wrapping up here, but I want to say that with the current proposal, I think that the sensible approach to that would have been to limit the amount of people with a background in law enforcement rather than to ban them ex and completely. And I think, again, a, a, an organization can say that they represent me. If I am not voting for them, I have not chosen them as my representative, and that's what concerns me. So it's, it's the direct accountability to voters and also a complete lack of experience is the problem. If it, it was a cap, like so 30% of the people on there could have a background in that field, I would say that was more reasonable than completely excluding them. But investigations do use documentation that comes from uh, law enforcement if investigations are necessary. Um, there will be a member of the city council involved. There'll be the mayor involved in choosing the organizations that will choose people. So again, I feel people really need to be watching the meetings that talk about this in more detail. Thank you so much. Thanks, folks. Um, and thank you for tuning in to Town Meeting TV's ongoing coverage of local candidates, local budgets, and ballot items. You can find this and more forums at www.ch17.tv. And please don't forget to vote on or before March 7th. Ballots are not mailed automatically, so please check with your local clerk and request a ballot if you need one to make sure to get to the polls. Thank you for watching and sharing Town Meeting TV. If you are not already, please subscribe to our Town Meeting TV YouTube channel. And thank you, Avery and Milo. Thank you.